we were able to make time from Jerusalem at night, dinner time, and I know I know it is both a difficult time and also just a busy time prepping for Pesach. If you'll give us another two minutes, we serve lunch here, so uh, still people are making their way through the line. Looks good. Sorry we can't send you stuffed shells and uh, blueberry crisp. I was um, just going to say, Hal, I should have ordered via Walt from Cleveland to I know. <laughs> I know. Oh. Don't they have DoorDash? No, Walt. <laughs> no, Walt. Oh, I don't know from that one. Do they still do, what's the other one? Teen Beach or whatever that was? Yes, yes, they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Walt is the best. Um, Wait. You're not supposed to do it. Oh, well, I didn't see. Yeah, so in general, we have mics all over our room so you can hear anybody. You may not be able to see everybody because the because this the vision of the camera isn't here, but we have about 15 people sitting around our table. Beautiful. And and uh, as you see, a number of other people online. Um, it is a if you remember from when you came in and you taught, it is a lively group that likes to ask a lot of questions, but we also know you have a lot that you prepared. So we you know, this is your this is your time, so you're welcome to tell people like you know I will get to your question later. You know, if there's specific either material you want to cover or or just a thoughts you want to share, because we're very honored to have your Torah straight from Yerushalayim. I think we're good. Yeah. So if you just a very brief moment of introduction, uh, our my colleague and friend Moreno Arav. Rabbi Matt Berkowitz, I hope that you got a chance to learn from him when he came to B'nai Yishren literally a year ago, last May, um, to be our scholar in residence and artist in residence for my installation weekend. Um, since his time here, he has a new position. He was just transitioning to be the vice president of Machon Schechter of the Schechter Institute, which is the graduate school, rabbinical school for the conservative movement. It actually does more than that. And Matt can probably talk more about it because it really serves uh, Am Yisrael and Eretz Yisrael, serves the people of Israel, not just for Masorti Judaism, but, but really provides educators and rabbis and teachers and leaders throughout Israel and Europe and North America and everywhere else. Again, not just for the conservative movement. But we're really honored to have artist and teacher and rabbi Matt Berkowitz with us. Thank you so much, Rabbi Hal Rudin Loria. It is um, such a privilege to be back uh, and to be virtually in that space. Uh, I have such fond memories of teaching in that room in Cleveland, and it is um, truly wonderful to be back with you. So thank you so much for the invitation. And I consider it a gift to make time for this group. And I do hope that over the course of the hour, it will be interactive. I look forward to hearing your questions. Um, and I think I'll, I'll pause at various moments uh, to open it up for some conversation. Right. So, so in addition um, to the beautiful introduction that Rabbi Hal Rudin Luria gave about um, Schechter Institutes, um, I will share with you that in addition to our rabbinical school and graduate school, we oversee the Tali educational system in Israel. And in our Tali system, we have about 85 schools all throughout the state of Israel. And what we do in Tali is uh, we are invited into secular Israeli schools to increase the amount of Jewish studies, to increase Jewish content in those schools, to bring our curriculum in, and it's a curriculum that focuses on teaching Jewish pluralism and uh, Jewish content in terms of uh, prayer, in terms of um, in terms of Tanakh, in terms of Mishnah, and uh, we're also working on curricular materials that are spread not only in the Tali schools but also throughout all of the secular schools in Israel. So that is the third branch of what we do at Schechter Institutes. The fourth branch of what we do at Schechter Institutes is called Midrash at Schechter. And under that rubric, we have an arts and culture center in Tel Aviv, in the Nevi Tzedek neighborhood in Tel Aviv. 
Uh, I don't have to tell you, Tel Aviv is another country compared to Jerusalem. And so we have to be much more creative in our outreach efforts and how we engage Jews in Tel Aviv, how we engage the Israeli population in Tel Aviv. We have about a thousand participants every week in the programming that we do in uh, Neve Shechter that focuses on arts and culture. And then the final branch of what we do is just before the war in Ukraine, we opened a center in Kiev and we are active in four cities in Ukraine. Uh, in Odessa, Chernivtsi, uh, in Kiev, and in Kharkiv. Uh, so that keeps us very, very busy. And in the summer, we're actually running a Rama program uh, in Chernivtsi. Uh, one of the most exciting pieces that I'll share with you is in three of the four cities in which we're active, we're organizing communal seders in those cities. Um, so we're delighted to be able to support that effort um, and uh, especially for another Jewish community uh, that is under siege. So that said, mm -hmm. let's jump into what we call Inyana Dioma, uh, the topic of the day. It's wonderful to be back with you, at least virtually, even under the circumstances that both the state of Israel and the Jewish world are experiencing at this very, very challenging moment. I did put together um, a PowerPoint presentation that I will go uh, back and forth with. So I, I'm just going to pull that up on screen. Um, and one of the reasons I wanna pull it up for you is that it begins with a bit of my art. I'm sure many of you remember my art from my visit a year ago. Hopefully you can all see the state of Israel. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And I begin with this illumination, Vihi She'amda. Mm -hmm. After we read of the Brit Ben Abitarim, that is the covenant of the parts in which God essentially shares with Avram what it is that his people will experience over the course of history, we read this section in the Haggadah, it is the lead up to the Magid section, the core section. And when we come to Vihi She'amda, literally she stood by us, we read the following. It was she who stood by our ancestors and by us in times of trouble and in times of joy. For it is not just one oppressor who has risen to annihilate us, but in every generation they seek to destroy us and God will redeem us from their hands. Or perhaps we should say, and we hope that God will redeem us from their hands. These classic words of the Haggadah will resonate to our core when we recite them during our Seder celebrations this year. In light of Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel this past Motzei Shabbat, the profound and utter truth of these words echoes from one end of the world to the other. This afternoon, I have been asked to share reflections on the situation in Israel and to help you understand better what Israelis are living through. I want to begin with this picture, which was taken on April 3rd, the day my daughter, Rachel Naama, drafted into the IDF. We made the journey from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, Tel Shomer military base. As we neared our destination, mm -hmm. one could see droves of young Israeli adults too young, as they abruptly closed the chapter of their childhood and continued on to a new chapter in which they were devoting their lives to the defense of the state of Israel. Emotional tears of separation gave way to reluctant smiles as we said our goodbyes to Rachel, as all of us did our best to show our strongest selves in this liminal moment. Never have I been so proud of my child, and never have I been so fearful of what awaits her and what awaits our dear country. I begin here 
because this moment encapsulates the personal and I would say political struggle that Israelis have been facing since that horrific day of October 7th. Just gonna take it off of stop share for a moment. We Israelis find ourselves in the midst of, I would say an existential war. Far from being post-trauma, we're continuing to live through the worst of the trauma of October 7th. The needs here are so great, especially the emotional and psychological needs. That day will go down in infamy as the greatest security failure of the state of Israel. Two sacred pillars were irreparably damaged. The first being the notion of Israeli military deterrence, the inexplicable failure of the IDF to protect Israeli communities in the south near the border with Gaza. Why was the army almost completely absent for nearly 24 hours? And then, of course, the second pillar that was shattered is the founding ethos of Zionism and founding ethos of the state of Israel. And that is that after the Holocaust, never again would we be in a position in which our people could not defend ourselves. October 7th represents a collapse into the radical insecurity of the Jewish people prior to the founding of our sovereign state. Essentially, post-October 8th, Israel became the most dangerous place for the Jewish people from a physical perspective, I would say. I add this caveat because from a physical perspective, that is true. But from a psychological and emotional perspective, I continue to believe that Israeli Jews are far healthier and safer here in the state of Israel, especially given the rise of anti-Semitism in the United States in general and on college campuses in particular, as we are seeing. One of the most sobering moments for me occurred on February 29th, and I'm going to pull up uh, my PowerPoint again to share some images with you. On February 29th, at the invitation of one of our Schechter graduate students, Anati Alkabetz, who you see in the center of this photo speaking with us, um, the Schechter faculty and staff were invited on a personal visit to the community of Kfar Aza. <clears throat> Anati and her husband Shimon tragically lost their daughter Sivan and their daughter's boyfriend Naor, both slaughtered in the attacks of October 7th. Up until this point, I had resisted touring the devastated communities of the Gaza envelope, both out of a sense of wanting to eschew voyeurism and knowing full well that the communities themselves were feeling violated and exploited by tourist visits, even solidarity missions with the best of intentions. In fact, Kibbutz Be'eri, the hardest hit community, closed its gates entirely to such visits. This, however, was different. Anati is a student of ours, and our community wanted to support her and embrace her family. Here you see her husband, Shimon, who welcomed us the moment we arrived at Kfar Aza. Literally, moments after we got to our destination, sirens blared, warning us that we had seconds to run into a shelter to protect ourselves from incoming rockets, still being fired from Gaza, it was amazing to me that they still had the capacity to fire at us on February 29th. From the concrete shelter, we walked slowly to the area of the kibbutz where young adults lived in modest homes. The remnants of destruction were around us and devastation as far as the eye could see. Indeed, all I could think to myself about was that Chaim Nachman Bialik must have had similar feelings. Here you see an image of Samuel Hershenberg's painting, which he completed in 1899. Samuel Hershenberg was a Jewish Polish artist. His painting is called The Wandering Jew. This was an incredibly powerful painting. And indeed, as a result of this painting, he was invited 
by none other than Boris Schatz, the founder of the Batsalel Art School in Jerusalem. He was invited by Schatz to be the, the artist, the, one, the first artist in residence at the Batsalel School. When you walked into the Batsalel School in Jerusalem, this was the first piece of art that you were greeted by. Right, mm -hmm. obviously a reflection of the persecution that the Jews experienced mm -hmm. in Europe, mostly in Eastern Europe, as it were. Right, you see this older man, this elderly man at the center, right, running out, fleeing from, mm -hmm. right, from his present, right, headed towards a light, a light that we want to believe is coming from Israel, right, from a new chapter that is facing the Jewish people and strewn all over his feet, right? You see the corpses of Jews persecuted all throughout the ages. Of course, mm -hmm. you see the crosses that he's surrounded by as well. This mm -hmm. painting was exhibited as part of an exhibition at the Israel Museum in which they dealt with the symbol of the crucifix in Jewish art. I use this as a lead into Chaim Nachman Bialik's piece known as the City of Slaughter. Chaim Nachman Bialik visited the city of Kishinev after its famous pogrom in 1903. And he wrote this very, very powerful piece in the City of Slaughter. Crushed in their shame, they saw it all. They did not stir or move. Those who survived this foulness, how did their menfolk bear it? How did they bear this yoke? They crawled forth from their holes. They fled to the house of the Lord, to the Rebbe's house they flitted. Tell me, O Rabbi, is my wife permitted to me? The matter ends and nothing more, and all is as it was before, concealed and cowering, the sons of Maccabees. So what was going on here for Chaim Nachman Bialik? Bialik was sent to Kishinev to take testimony from the survivors of that pogrom. And as a result of that experience, he writes this powerful epic poem in which he criticizes traditional Judaism for being passive. The state of Israel comes along to remedy that weakness, as it were, of the Jewish people, right? Wow. To say that we are the modern day Maccabees and we are going to defend our people we are not going to flee back to our caves, right? Or to the Rebbe's house, as Chaim Nachman Bialik says in the city of slaughter, but rather we are going to defend our people. That was the great betrayal that I'm talking about on October 7th. And here we return to the images that we saw on Kfar Aza, right? This is in front of the home in which Sivan and and her boyfriend Naor lived, right? And these are the images that one sees in Kfar Aza, right? As I was seeing these images flash before my eyes, all I could think of is that emotionally, this is, must have been the same response that Chaim Nachman Bialik had as he was walking through Kishinev. It's one thing to see images like this, and it's another um, to bear witness in person. So I want to pause for a moment before I continue with my talk and uh, just to hear any particular reactions or questions that you have uh, to give us a moment to digest everything that I've said so far. Nelson, it's never again too hmm. passive uh, a slogan. We're it, waiting. It, never it, again. Is never again too passive a slogan? Yeah. <laughs> it's very, very interesting. When we think of the slogan never again, right, the intent of never again was not that the nations would not persecute us. Right. But the intent of never again is that we will never again go to the slaughter like defenseless lambs. Right. In other words, we will defend ourselves. OK. And that 
is essentially the promise that Zionism gave us. That's essentially the promise that the state of Israel gave us. And that is, you know, what the IDF represents for us. Uh, so I want to believe in terms of the content of Never Again, I do not believe that that is um, passive in, in any way. If anything, it speaks to an activist approach that we take to defending ourselves today. It was an, another question in the room or a comment? Yeah, Elliot, yeah, Elliot, uh, uh, I guess what I'm about to ask you is philosophical. We're thousands of miles away from the horrors there. So my question to you, Rabbi, is how do you find words when there are no words? <laughs> that That <clears throat> is... Um, a very, very important question. How do you find words where, when there are no words? Um, part of the way that, that, that we find words, uh, I would say here in Israel, is uh, by turning to comfort each other. I think one of the most powerful responses that we've seen since October 7th has to do with civil society in Israel. How common citizens have pulled together to help each other all throughout the devastation that we're seeing. And where the government did not respond quickly enough or is not responding quickly enough uh, to victims of the horrors, whether they be the Nova Music Festival or evacuees from the North, evacuees from the South, uh, I feel that our fellow citizens have been responding in very, very meaningful ways. Uh, I'm thinking of Ofakim in particular, one of the emergency projects that we led at Schechter Institutes was um, taking care of the number of families in Ofakim. There were 51 families that each lost a member of the family to the atrocities on October 7th. And there were between 50 and 70 families whose homes were damaged or destroyed on October 7th. Uh, there you have uh, no words when you see this, uh, this destruction, but I would say that you know the words are spoken amongst us, and the words create new new worlds for us. Uh, I think you know we we need to find those words to be able to communicate powerfully uh, and substantively what our experience was on October seventh, and in the aftermath, how it is that that we're moving forward. I'm happy to take another question before jumping back in. I just wanted to reflect, and it was very powerful that that poem that you brought, and I I think that's the other answer I think to Eliot is, right, what, what are the words? The words are looking back at the words, just like when, you know, many of us have been studying the Haggadah over the last couple of weeks to prepare for our Siddharim or what to teach our, our congregation, right, and the uh, the Haggadah has so much to say at this moment also. Um, I, I think it is critical to be able to find those words. Chaim Nachman Bialik does it by turning back to our past, right? What is Chaim Nachman Bialik's response to moving forward? It's reminding his fellow Jews that we are the descendants of Maccabees. Okay, so that's an incredibly powerful notion. He's reminding a power, a seemingly powerless people that once upon a time we were heroes, right? And 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 I believe in so many ways that is what that is the essence of the state of Israel. Uh, we had this momentary relapse into the powerlessness of diasporic existence in Eastern Europe, right? But I believe that we're finding ourselves again throughout, right, throughout this this challenging journey. And I believe that we're, 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 we will get ourselves back on track. Helena? I just have a... Yeah, yeah. I Hopefully. wanted just to mention, just uh, to mention something, that not everybody that was in the Holocaust were going like Hebes um, Laesh, okay? Right. They were fighting in different ways. So we cannot just say that everybody was just lame and doing nothing. Right. Uh, no, absolutely. I completely embrace what you're saying. But 
it's important to understand what Chaim Nachman Bialik was responding to, right? And Chaim Nachman Bialik was not responding to people that were acting in a heroic sort of way. What was frustrating to Chaim Nachman Bialik in his situation was what he perceived to be rabbinic quietism and passivity. And he felt that we needed to be able to rebel against that. So it's very, I appreciate what you're saying, Alina, because we need to put, we we need to understand both perspectives. Yeah, but we still have in our country nowadays, uh, people who say we'll wait for God to help us and not do anything. You're right. And we can't, we can't. And it causes a big division among the Israelis. Yeah. Okay. I understand. There was a, another voice in the room. Uh, I I wanted to bring in something else that uh, kind of a, I guess, a diaspora perspective for whatever it's worth. It might help you. It might help me to hear your response. Um, my mother, who was a very wise person, used to say that the biggest problem we maybe have as a people is we're just so small that we can't do it. We can't do necessarily do anything on our own, and we're big enough to be targeted by more or less everybody else, um, which is how I got into community relations, I suppose, which is building friendships among among other things. And one of the things that October 7th does, for better or worse, outside of Israel, is we see who our friends are and who we thought were our friends that maybe aren't, who might be our friends but don't understand. Uh, and the vast bulk of more or less passive people, uh, who maybe just period, don't understand. And I want to just give you a quick vignette and get your response. My wife, Debbie, and I recently attended the uh, Cleveland International Film Festival, which is a very large film festival with films from around the world. One of them was a Palestinian film that I think was called Goodbye Tiberius. We did not see it. However, it was an award winner. At the award ceremony, the jury that gave it its award specifically cited it as a film against imperialism and against uh, uh, colonialism. And the first thing I thought is this isn't colonialism. This is a people returning to their land. It's a problem that we have another group of people who feel displaced. I'm not trying to dismiss that, but it's not colonialism and it's not imperialism. But that's the way many people perceived it. And when the film won its award, it got a great deal of applause, except from a handful of us in the room who are in some sense appalled. So wearing my community relations hat, it feels like we have a lot of work to do uh, to explain to our friends and maybe more importantly to those who aren't necessarily yet our friends, what you said when you started your talk, which is that the, this horrible event on October 7th shattered this illusion that something like this isn't going to happen because the IDF is going to prevent it before it happens. Right. Uh, I am so disturbed that that was the response to, it's one thing for the film to win an award. It's, it, it's, uh, it's something else to say that it showcases the... Right, the battle against imperialism and, and colonialism. The, the, the other piece that I would add to what you just said uh, is we need to do a better job educating a, a younger generation of Jews, right? I am talking about Jews who are in their teenage years, who are in their 20-somethings, uh, and they need to understand themselves that Zionism is not a colonialist movement. <laughs> Right, that, mm -hmm. that Zionism is, as you said so beautifully, it's about the return of the people to its native land. We have 4,000 <clears throat> years of history, right? I often point to a speech that President Obama gave in either 2008, 2009, uh, when he was trying to reset relations with the Arab world in Cairo. And he made the mistake of attributing the founding of the state of Israel to the Holocaust. Right. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, he did a great injustice against the Jewish people. Right. The Holocaust, yes, plays a major role in the founding of the state, but he didn't mention 4,000 years of roots that the Jewish people have in the land of Israel. 
right? And that's a very, very critical piece of, of, of the story that, that we need to tell. And it needs to be told both to the outside world and we need to do a much better job of educating our youth in terms of connection to Israel, in terms of Zionist values. It needs to begin at a, a, a younger age. And that sense of Jewish peoplehood needs to be nurtured in compelling ways. Okay, I'm going to continue for a bit, and then I'll right. we'll pause again for uh, to open it up to to more questions and comments. So I I want to say that in Israel we're currently facing an impossible choice between two essential elements of the Israeli ethos. The first is the notion and very, very important mitzvah of Pidyon Shvuim, the redemption of captives, bringing attention to the approximately 136 hostages that remain in Hamas hands in Gaza. The core of who we are as Israelis is that we don't leave anyone behind, not in the battlefield and not in Hamas tunnels. Mm. And the second core part of Israeli ethos is self defense. We cannot allow the genocidal regime of Hamas to remain on the border with Israel. Yossi Klein Halevi animates the crux of this dilemma powerfully. He was part of two conversations on the very same day. One friend turned to him and said the following, quote, if we let the hostages die, this is not the same Israel, and I cannot say if this is a country worth fighting for, unquote. And his other friend said to him, quote, if we give in to Hamas blackmail, I am going to tell my children to leave, unquote. Right? It goes without saying, nonetheless, I will say it explicitly here, the vast majority of Israelis are in support of freeing the hostage, hostages, even at an exorbitantly high price. We want as many of the remaining hostages back alive and home as soon as possible. For me personally, one of the most tragic results of October 7th is the refusal of Israelis to even discuss the notion of a two-state solution now. Mm -hmm. While I certainly understand the strong emotion behind it, I ask aloud, what is the alternative? Mm -hmm. As my teacher and friend Yossi Klein Halevi says, quote, two states are a disaster, unquote, and one state is even worse, he goes on to say. Uh right? These two peoples cannot, under any circumstances, share one state. We together need to begin a process of separating from each other. This is a radically dysfunctional and destructive relationship. Separation in the form of two states is the only way, that is, if we desire for Israel to continue being both a Jewish and a democratic state. I, for one, am not willing to give up on such a premise. And Finally, with regard to the current prime minister, 70% of Israelis are calling upon Netanyahu to step down at this point. Really? Many, as you well know, are demanding new elections in the country. The vast majority of us have lost confidence in this coalition government. There is deep distrust, distrust as a result of the divide brought on by the judicial reforms that would have undermined mm -hmm. democracy which were occurring before October 7th, as well as the greatest tragedy that has befallen the Jewish state. Jews and particularly Israelis have a long memory and Benjamin Netanyahu will now be remembered for October 7th. And now with the added layer of the Iranian attacks on the country, anxiety here is at an all time high. A recent poll by the Hebrew University of Jerusalem said that approximately 75% of Israelis are against a retaliatory strike on Iran. Better for this government to do some soul searching toward maintaining the coalition that coalesce successfully in support of defending Israel and think through our actions wisely. Yeah. There was a lot that I just said. Let's let's hear your voices. 
seems to me we just have too much on our plate right now. And you're right, we need to call it, we need to think it through. They're running away. They'll always, they'll expect some, uh, we do have to react and they're running away because they can do something that they've been doing in the past. Why do we have to do anything open? But they've got, they, they can't take care. I mean, who does he think we are? We have Hamas, we, we have the, um, Hezbollah, mm -hmm. uh, right. is also part of Iran. It's just, you know, there's a limit to what people can do. Right. I I completely agree with what you're saying. Our cup overflows. Uh, yeah, with, exactly. Um, with too many challenges here. Uh, with everything unfolding in Gaza, as mm -hmm. you're pointing at, everything occurring on the northern border with Hezbollah, uh, everything bubbling over in the West Bank, and of course, Iran adding this whole other layer in addition uh, to Iran's proxies, uh, which are laying siege to us. Uh, so obviously, these decisions need to be thought through in a very, very deliberate way. Uh, Israel does need, on the one hand, to reestablish its military deterrence, right? Mm -hmm. But on the other, on the other, it needs to do it in in a very sophisticated and and and, and planful way. So I have three questions, for better or worse. One is uh, regarding your first comment about a two state solution, which I think most people in the United States, Jew Jewish people in the United States, think is probably the only way to eventually solve this problem. But when you say that few Israelis want to talk about it anymore, it strikes me that the probable reason is that there appears to be no partner on the other side to negotiate borders of what would be the two states. As long as that continues to be the case, I don't know what the short-term answer is. Maybe this is just a long-term slog, and I'm interested in your reaction to that. If you like, I'll hold the other two questions, or I can ask them all at once. Okay, no, no, no. Let's pause there, because there's plenty to be said on that. Please remind me of your name. <laughs> I'm David. David. Okay, thank you, David. Um, so, look, Martin Indyk wrote a, a very, very important piece in Foreign Affairs magazine, about the return to the two-state solution, okay? An, an idea that, you know, was essentially abandoned for uh, the past 10 or 15 years, or it was pushed to the side. Uh, and certainly our current prime minister wants nothing to do with this notion of a, 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 of a two-state solution, even though he gave lip service uh, once upon a time to the idea of a two-state solution. Yes. What instills me with great fear is I am seeing more and more written on the idea of a one-state solution, right? And what a one-state solution means, in my mind, right, is, is clearly yeah. handing a demographic victory over to Palestinian Arabs, right? All they need to do is be patient long enough. Eventually, they will outnumber us Right. They will vote us out of the Knesset. Right. And then Israel will become yet another failed nation state, exactly like Lebanon. OK, that that is what concerns me so deeply. And in the same breath, I will I will I will say that I, I understand the perspective of not wanting to award the Palestinians a state in this moment and clearly not with the leadership that is on their side. Everyone acknowledges that there need, there need to be serious reforms in the Palestinian Authority before we can sit down and talk tachless what it is that a Palestinian state will look like on Israel's borders. Everyone acknowledges that, thank God. Well, people who are sane and have their heads screwed on right acknowledge that there need to be certain refor reformations in the Palestinian Authority before we can have um, a a partner here. So I believe, David, what needs to happen is the vision, the idea of two states does need to be back on the table. It needs to be articulated. Uh, there needs to be a, uh, a timeline that we establish, um, which might be, let's <clears throat> say, five years. There needs to be a realistic horizon for the establishment of a Palestinian state 
And during that time, if there is a, a realistic horizon, I want to believe the necessary reforms that need to happen on the Palestinian side will will happen on that side. Uh, I, I just now you sound uh, just like a colonial power. We'll make peace when you change. Uh, mm -hmm. There are plenty of Palestinian Arabs that acknowledge that reforms need to be made and serious mm -hmm. reforms need to be made, right? What, Ma Ma what Mahmoud Abbas's leadership represents at this point is a benign or not so benign dictatorship. When was the last time there were elections in the West Bank? Isn't um, the joke that he's in like the 20th year of his four year, year, four -year term? Right, exa ex exactly. So Palestinian, what I'm saying now, Sin, is Palestinians themselves acknowledge that these reforms need to take place, right? And um, and and the the added layer of all of this is that the only way that moderate Arab states are going to contribute to the rebuilding of Gaza right, is if there is some sort of, of, of timeline like this, if we're talking about two states, right? Otherwise, what interest does the United Arab Emirates or Saudi Arabia or Qatar have in rebuilding infrastructure in, in, uh, in Gaza? Is there a democratic Arab state? Is there a democratic Arab state? Uh, no, no. I, 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 I think there is, um, I, you know, I, I think we sort of have to view democracy on a spectrum, right? <laughs> and there are more liberal expressions of democracy and less liberal expressions of democracy. I want to believe that that, um, uh, you know, there there are moderate Arab states that have some, you know, some taste of democracy, but uh, it it is it is a serious problem in in the Arab world. We have yeah. another Haiti. So Saudi Arabia now um, has at least um, in undercover and um, secretly been telling people that you know they're willing to help Israel because they they really now see how bad Iran is. And most of the Arab states, the problem is the way I, not the way I read it, but what I am reading is that the leaders of these countries, of these Arab states, want to make peace or have relations with Israel. What they don't want is to have, it's the people of these countries, oh, our poor Palestinian, our, uh, and our Gazan uh, relatives, they're all hurting. But what they don't understand again, because you see that the uh, the governments are not the people. In this case, the governments are making sense. They're they're able to see finally that they can progress. I think basically the governments want to be a little more liberal. Their wives are probably getting to them that they want. They want to get dressed and get out. <laughs> Look, in, in the context of this conversation, it's very, very important to point out that the rapprochement that you're talking about is happening with the Sunni Arab world, right? You have this very, very important yeah. division between Sunni and Shiite, right? And Iran is a Shiite regime, right? And there has been this divide in the Arab world. Uh, you know, and many believe that one of the reasons that Hamas did uh, did what it did on October 7th was to torpedo a potential deal between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, look, I, I want to believe that... The Saudis are saying that. The, right, the Saudi, right, according the Saudi, to our newspaper. Right, the, the Saudis are indeed saying that. Uh, so there there is potentially good that can come out of this. Um, but it's going to take leadership on all sides to make this happen. So as a follow-up, if Hamas is to be defeated because it's not acceptable for Israel to have Hamas there, and many in this country don't believe that's possible, I don't have enough information to know whether it's possible other than to say that it's disturbing to hear that missiles still come out of uh, Gaza despite the level of carnage and physical destruction. Uh, 
Do you think that some kind of Marshall Plan is the answer for finding a partner there that supplants Hamas? I think ultimately, David, there, there, there does need to be some some plan like that. Uh, you know, right now, um, the you know the crisis that we're in is one of uh, leadership on 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 both sides. Right. And it's finding the, you know, the rational leaders on both sides that whose opinions can 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 prevail. Uh, I certainly understand that it's impossible to defeat Hamas as an ideology. Um, I, I just do not see any other answer. Um, I know the world is com almost completely against Israel going into Rafa at this point. Um, and at the same time, I do not see Israel being able to handle this in, in any other way. In fact, David Brooks wrote um, a very, very important piece in the New York Times. I want to say it was about three or four weeks ago. Uh, and I encourage you all to read it, look it up. Um, it's practically a book in the op-ed section of the New York Times. And he asks, you know, what else would you have Israel do besides what it's doing? And he essentially describes the impossible situation that the state of Israel is in now, um, yes. and um, you know, and 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 definitely, you know, cooler yes. cooler heads need to prevail, and there needs there there needs to be effective leadership. I think we have to remember. Seventy seventy years ago, I thought that it will take one or two, ten or twenty years of education to solve the problem. Unfortunately, I'm disillusioned. It's not true. We gave them many opportunities. The problem is that if, and Golda said it better than anybody could say, they don't care about their own kids mm -hmm. because the hatred towards the Israelis is so big, bigger than the love for their own kids. And they teach children to hate from childhood, brainwashing them. How can it change? Right. So, Alina, you're you're um, echoing the words of Golda Meir, who said that the the Palestinian Arabs need to learn to love their their children more than they hate us. And um, I I don't know what it's <laughs> going to take. I don't know what it's going to take. But I also refuse to sink into um, you know, a, a, a sense of despair. You know, if um, if I lived my life only through the lens of despair, I certainly wouldn't be living my life in 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 Israel. I need I need to hold on to a sense of optimism. I need to hold on to a sense of the possibility of coexistence here. Matt, um, Aaron here wanted to say something, and then I wanted to ask a question. What I wanted to say is that these countries that we're dealing with have never, ever experienced democracy, ever, ever in their history. It's always been controlled by a strong person, man, dictator, whether it be religious person or not. They don't know anything about democracy. Strictly who is the leader and that's who we follow. There's no sense of democracy. I think that Israel has to go in and tell these people, Never again. If you come to us and we see what is happening, we will destroy you. We will make you into absolutely nothing. They will understand that logic to them because that's all it is, is a power struggle. If we try to go through kindness and building things for them, uh, educating their children, and this, they don't get it. They really don't get it. And the people and the people of the various countries, the governments of them, they don't care about the others. They don't care about this. If Saudi Arabia really cares about what's happening in Iraq, they don't care. It's just that how is it going to benefit them? That's all. Right. Connected to what you're saying, Aaron, you're reminding me of an important point that Yossi Klein Halevi makes, which is uh you know, he, he said uh, that Israelis deluded themselves over the past 10 years that we could simply live with the status quo, okay, and not make a move toward two states or just, you know, li live with the situation as it is. Uh, no. And he critiques the government 
for not responding forcefully to the rocket attacks. You know, we just became used to these rocket attacks in Southern Israel and we accommodated. We put up concrete shelters through the help of JNF USA all mm -hmm. over uh, the South to protect our citizens. Uh, mm -hmm. And that itself uh, eroded our military deterrence. You know, and so on the one hand, yes, we do have to respond forcefully, but on the other, that's not a substitute for solid policy, right? Yeah. It's not a substitute for diplomacy, and the politicians need to do their part as well. In fact, many of the military generals in Israel are criticizing the government now uh, quite forcefully for not thinking about the day after. Right. What is the plan? And and at this point, it's completely absent. Um, well, they Rabbi know, Matt, oh, they know oh. that we have the capability uh, of enemies. That, yes, that we have the capability of destroying them. Amen. So, Rabbi Amen. Matt, I know you prepared a lot. So, I want to make sure in the seven minutes, there are things that you prepared that you want to present to us, and also, um, I don't know if you did. I stepped out for five minutes. If you did it. Um, how are you incorporating October 7th into your Seder and post-October 7th? Okay, I am so glad you asked uh, both questions. Okay. <laughs> so so how, how am I incorporating it into our Seder? Uh, so that is the perfect segue into telling you about a very, very special project that our studio, known as Kola Ot, um, which is uh, based in... Jerusalem's uh, artist <clears throat> colony. Uh, we were commissioned to create a uh, website to advocate for mm. the release of the hostages by the Goldberg Poland family. And mm. I am going to show you that website very briefly. There are Pesach Seder resources on that website. And they give you all sorts of ideas of how to remember the hostages at your Seder table. I'm going to show it to you on screen quickly. Okay, so this, can, can you all see this? Yeah, yes. now I can. Now? Yes. Great. Okay, so if you scroll down a bit, okay, um, Essentially, what you have here are educational toolkits um, and different ways of advocating every single day, different ways of performing some action to advocate for the release of the hostages. You can click on any of these, okay, and it will come up with important resources. If you go to Jewish Moments, Ties to Tradition, where I am, click on Take Action. Okay, and there you see, bring um, what okay. one moment. Oh, wait, oh, here on the other side, it was on the other side. Yeah. Here, when the four questions yeah. aren't there to ask, when, when the four children aren't there to ask questions at the Seder, bringing the hostages to your Seder, how might the, we integrate hope for the return of our hostages into our Seders this year? Click there, okay, and it comes up with a whole Seder supplement. Oh. Okay, um, Rabbi, I can send you the links to all of this. Right, and thank you. You could pass it on to the group, or yes. could you send me the emails and I'll send it. Either way. Yep, okay. we will share it, thank you. Fantastic, okay, so I will get that into your hands. Uh, and notice you've got a facilitator guide here, and you have the Seder supplement to use. Easy to print out, bring to your Seder table, and keep referring back to this particular site. Again, it's called Everyone Counts. I will send you the link. The last piece of learning that I want to share with you is relating to the Magid section, when we tell the story. Okay, you will all recognize this passage, which is taken from Deuteronomy 26. And I'm going to read this passage out loud. This is what the entire Magid section is based on. My father was a fugitive Aramean. He went down to Egypt with meager numbers and sojourned there. 
but there he became a great and very populous nation. The Egyptians dealt harshly with us and oppressed us. They imposed heavy labor upon us. We cried out to Adonai, the God of our ancestors, and Adonai heard our plea. One moment. I'm sorry, one moment. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry. The Egyptians dealt harshly with us and oppressed us. They imposed heavy labor upon us. We cried to Adonai, the God of our ancestors. Adonai heard our plea and saw our plight, our misery and our oppression. Adonai freed us from Egypt by a mighty hand, by an outstretched arm, awesome power and by signs and portents. So the piece that I wanna share with you is that the excerpt from Torah, which I just read here, that we see in the Haggadah ends right here. Okay, if you look at the Haggadah, I am sure many of you, as I was reading it, you recognized it from the Maxwell House Haggadah or whatever <laughs> Haggadah it is that yeah. you use. Okay, and immediately after this passage, we have a number of midrashic quotes, right, that explicate, that take apart, right, this bit by bit, right, and we expound on this. But what's so fascinating to me is that when you look at the traditional text of the Haggadah, what did it do? It edited out the last line of the passage. The last line of the passage says the following, bringing us to this place and giving us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Wherefore, I now bring the first fruits of the soil, which you, Adonai, have given me. Why did the rabbis in the traditional Haggadah edit out the part about coming into the land of Israel? I'm asking you this not just rhetorically. I'm curious to hear why you think they would do that. Why did they cut out Israel? When they wrote it, they, there was no Israel. We're not all in Israel. It's been a long time. In other words... That's a good question. Mm. Okay, look, first of all, right, very good. I'm receiving very good answers here. First of all, number one, we're it's at a time in which we were stateless. We were not sovereign in our own land. We didn't have Israel to speak of. Okay, so that's number one. Two is, as you're pointing out also, right, we're not all in Israel. But I ask you the question, right, we don't cut out Lashana Habab Yerushalayim, you know, next year in Jerusalem, which is a wish. In many ways, it's aspirational. It's not just about physically being in Jerusalem, but it's aspirational, right? So why, why edit that out? What were, what were the rabbis communicating? And I think part of what the rabbis were communicating is they wanted to put the emphasis on the journey and not the destination. Okay, that was a critical piece for the rabbis in conveying this message. Mm -hmm. However, since we today are living in a miraculous time in which the Jewish people has returned to its homeland, in which we have a state of Israel, it seems to me that one of the most important assignments that we have in preparing for mm -hmm. Seder is figuring out, especially this year, of how it is that we can weave Israel into the Seder, right? How it is that we can have important, constructive, real conversations about Israel over the course of the Seder, right? Not edit it out like the rabbis did, but bring it back in. Mm -hmm. And I will say, those of you who last year acquired my Haggadah, the Lovel Haggadah, you'll notice that when I when this passage appears... I include the line about God bringing us into the land of Israel. I do it in a way that it's color coded, right? So that you understand that that one line doesn't appear in the traditional text. Mm -hmm. okay. But I think it's worth asking ourselves the question, Seder night, how do we bring Israel back, back into our conversation, back into the family uh, and Right. And have Israel there seated at the table, uh, not just right, being cognizant of the absence of all of those precious people that are being held hostage 
in Gaza, but also figuring out, right, and, and having those real conversations about our relationship uh, to Israel. That's so beautiful. Thank you so much, Rabbi Berkowitz. Thank you, Matt. Um, it's really been an honor to have you join us. I know it's a very busy and difficult time, and it's late at night for you. But uh, your Torah, uh, your heart, your art, um, and your teaching really are inspirational and, and helped answer a lot of questions for us, and also to be able to share some of our own feelings and the way that you're able to weave that into our class. Um, we're very grateful. Thank you again, Ralph, for this invitation. I so enjoyed being with all of you. I feel like we need a part two and a part three. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, we may come back enjoyed, again. I yeah. always enjoy being with your community. So thank yeah. you so much for opening uh, opening the study group to me. It, it, it was a real treat to be with all of you. L'shana haba biyushalayim habnuya. Next year, please, Amen. God, we build Jerusalem. Hag sameach to you all. And we're thinking about Rachel, Rachel, and all of you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. Be well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.